Okay, so uh, thank you everybody. So um, myself, uh, Gabriele Poloni, um, I work for Red Hat as a open source uh, technical leader. I also am the um, uh, chairman of ELISA uh, governing board. And uh, today I will present together with, uh, with Daniel, uh, also working on Red Hat as a principal engineer and uh, Linux maintainer. And the reason why we are here is because we would like to, to have a discussion to present you um, an architectural model that we presented uh, in uh, ELISA in the last workshop. And uh, we want to have feedbacks from uh, a wider audience, okay? Okay, so today here yeah, we'll uh, present a maintainable uh, scalable and verifiable software architectural design model for a uh, uh, Linux kernel. Okay. Um, some disclaimer. So this is a work in progress, and uh, there are no results that are binding on behalf of Elisa uh, or the Linux Foundation, and we don't make any safety claim based on this uh, preliminary report. Um, agenda so for first first we'll say what is in scope and out of scope of this presentation then we will look into possible functional safety qualification approaches for linux then we will uh, go into the core of this presentation so we will present this tailored architectural model um, we we'll look into a specific example the ioctl and then we will see how this model can be verified through the runtime verification monitors that is uh, what daniel has been working uh, on uh, in the last uh, few months i think and then we will look in, at the next steps and we'll uh, take question and uh, answers okay <clears throat> okay so what is the scope um we will as, as i said so we will present uh, uh, a proposal about uh, um, uh, high level description and uh, architectural design and um, that is suitable you know to, to meet ISO 26262 requirements we will talk about software verification methodology associated to the architectural model um, we will not talk about the uh, overall FUSA qualification strategy for Linux and uh, <clears throat> we will uh, not touch on any standard, any safety standard that is beyond ISO 26262. That is the safety standard that is used for automotives. Okay, so what are the options that we have today to qualify a pre-existing software component to be used into uh, a safety critical system? Okay. And in this case, the Linux kernel is our pre-existing software component. So today, we, as of today, we have part 8.12, that is a black box approach, and it is based on verifying the uh, software component uh, top level specification, okay? Um, so basically you define the top level nominal and safety requirement, and you derive a comprehensive test campaign and then you can <clears throat> say that this software component is qualified to, to be used in a functional safety system, okay? Now, this is only accepted uh, today for, uh, you know, for software component of reduced uh, comp complexity and uh, whose behavior indeed can be comprehensively, comprehensively described by the top level specifications, okay? Then we have part six, that is, uh, a white box approach and it is a modular hierarchical okay and this is suitable to develop and assess software component of any complexity really okay so there are no limits and uh, indeed because it is a white box approach and then we have uh, part 8.14 that is the promeny use okay so basically if we have uh, if there is enough statistical data about failure uh, in time of the software component under qualification and if the software component usage condition 
are uh, identical or very common to those that are uh, used to, to collect the statistical data, then you can say that the, the software component is, uh, is uh, qualified according to the proven use argumentation, okay? Uh, and then there is part 10.9, uh, that is uh, the software element out of context. This doesn't provide any uh, guidance in practice because it would just, in the end, it redirects to the, um, to the, to the uh, qualification routes that we, we talked about already, okay? So today, so we will not talk about the proven use, so it is out of scope. We, uh, the architectural design uh, approach that we'll present, it, it's based on part 8.12 and part 6 together, okay? Okay, so as I already said, uh, part 8.12 is uh, pretty simple. We have the safety and nominal requirement, the pre-existing code, we have uh, um, a requirement-based testing campaign, and uh, there is no architecture required, okay? So just a high level uh, description of the uh, safety and nominal requirements, okay? Indeed, it's understandable that the amount of artifacts and collaterals to maintain in this case is pretty low, okay? Um, on the flip side, when we go and look into the part six standard approach, we can see that there are quite few activities that are involved. Okay, so uh, we start from the safety concept, then we have the safety and nominal requirement, we have the software architectural design, the unit testing, implementation, uh, sorry, the unit design, implementation, then unit test, integration test, platform test, and validation test. And following this approach for uh, to assess a, a software component that was not developed um, according to part six, it, it can be, you know, pretty painful and would require a huge amount of rework, especially if we go down, you know, if we look from the unit design below, so the, the effort, uh, you know, it, it can explode really, okay. So now, uh, as I said, you know, the, the possible approach for Linux, given this uh, um, uh, overview. So, I mean, part 8.12 alone is, is uh, I mean, it's not applicable because Linux is too complex. Part six is, uh, can be applied. However, it's quite challenging uh, with respect to the amount of work required. Um, part 8.14 is applicable, the proven use, but there must be statistical data, okay? So, and, uh, and the usage condition must be similar uh, to those uh, where the statistical data uh, was collected, okay? So, as I, as I said, for today, the 8.14 is out of scope, okay? Okay, so problem is Linux is too complex for 8.12, uh, part six is too complex for Linux. What, what do we do? So the, this is uh, basically what we, what we proposed. Okay, so basically down from the technical safety concept down to the software architectural design, uh, the idea is to follow uh, part six. And then the, the single units that in part six usually are the single functions would be replaced by uh, bigger units really. And, uh, and the idea was to start with the driver subsystems, okay? And, uh, and then, so the, the idea would be to qualify the single driver subsystems according to part 8.12. And then when it comes to the software architectural design and integration testing and above, we will uh, follow part six, okay? So in practice, when it comes to an architectural model to, to, to describe uh, this, uh, to support this approach, um, what happens is that we have the, the Linux kernel, 
so where we have a, a very simplified and a realistic view on the right okay so the linux kernel would be uh, partitioned into a macro block right that could be uh, driver and subsystems uh, at least to start with okay and each of these block is a software unit for each software unit the design specification can be uh, described can be defined using a natural language effectively using the kernel doc headers and when it comes to the interactions between the different blocks there will be uh, a semi-formal or formal notation okay a semi-formal notation is basically a uml diagram for example okay and uh, so so the idea is that so to to formally or semi-formally describe the interaction between the macro blocks and to describe the behavior of, of the single blocks using the the natural language so leveraging the kernel doc headers now we talked about partitioning okay but then indeed the the problem is what is the you know what is the criteria to to make this partitioning okay so how can we say okay this software unit is simple enough okay to be uh, to, to to be described using the, the kernel doc headers right and <clears throat> So if we look into part 8.12, that is the, the route that will be that should be followed to, to qualify the single block, it, it is required that uh, the specification of the software component must be described in terms of known safety requirements, known functional requirements, behavior in case of failure, resource usage, description of required and provided interfaces, and shared resources and configuration description okay so if you're able to specify comprehensively in natural language all of the specs above for a single block for a single unit then the level of granularity is uh, the right one okay so as you know uh, most of you probably so um, maintainers already provide a sort of uh, a view of linux partitioning okay and can be used as a starting point okay to to, to have a partitioning of uh, of linux and uh, plus uh, the the maintainers are, are 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 human okay so that would make it easy to map the single blocks to the also to the people that are responsible for, for them okay and uh, well if we figure out that okay a certain subsystem or driver is too complex then uh, there is nothing preventing you know uh, to divide it further okay and um, and and you know it would be quite trivial you know to to maintain a, a new uh, partitioning file uh, to be honest okay so that is not uh, the problem uh, really Now let, let's look into uh, a specific example to, to better explain what, what we mean, okay? So this example is taken from uh, the work that we've been doing uh, in ELISA, okay? And uh, one of the uh, safety critical functionality that we analyzed is the capability of Linux to set uh, the timeout of a watchdog uh, using an IOCTL okay and uh and so this is so with respect to this feature okay our top level safety requirement is you know the, the watchdog subsystem shall ensure the watchdog timeout to be set according to the octal input parameter okay then considering this requirement we we looked that so the, the first uh, input entry point is the octal itself okay then okay we analyzed the the, the octal uh, the subsystem associated to the octal that is the vfs and uh, 
you can see that from the maintainer file that we have uh, the, the granularity here, okay? So the maintainer file is exactly saying what are the files that belong to this block, okay? Accordingly to the uh, IOPTL uh, use case, we, we identified uh, the subsystems and drivers that in the context of the IOPTL, uh, the VFS communicate with. And this is uh, a communication diagram that we uh, derived, okay? So you can see that um, there are uh, some subsystems that are uh, abstract, um, like the Arch subsystem. So in our case, we consider it x86, then we have the security subsystem, the watchdog device driver subsystem, the work queue subsystem, and there are some functions that do not belong to any subsystem uh, right now, okay? So, but as we said, maintainer is a starting point, okay? The, the key concept here is that, so the communication diagram provides a static view of the relationships between the target software unit that here is VFS and the, and all the others one that, that it communicates with. Also, what we did, we built uh, a flow diagram that is hardly uh, readable, but basically it will provide the view of the dynamic behavior following an ioctal of the uh, file systems in interacting uh, with the other uh, subsystems and drivers and also uh, re responding you know, to, to, to events, right? And uh, the communication diagram together with this uh, flow diagram, this is what constitute our uh, semi-formal notation for the, uh, our architectural design, okay? Then when it comes to the block specification, we tried to elaborate on the uh, IOCTOL kernel doc header to uh, add uh, all the missing information, um, you know, with respect to the, to the current uh, kernel doc header. And with the goal, you know, to, to provide uh, a description uh, of uh, the behavior of IOCTOL uh, so that a test campaign could be derived from this uh, uh, specification, you know, for the for the single block. Okay, um, you can see there is a to do in the end because we didn't consider uh, a set of uh, ioctl commands. Okay, but you know this is okay. I mean, it's uh, we can have uh, uh, some gap, so we we know that uh, that must be uh, added. Okay. Then, okay, so this is the IOCTAL pre existing code. And uh, indeed, when it comes to block testing, uh, you know, uh, we can use kernel self test to define a comprehensive uh, test campaign for the block uh, VFS with respect to the IOCTAL scenario. Okay. And, uh, and then when it comes uh, uh, to the architecture, when it comes to the integration test, and in, that, in this case, we need to verify the, the software architectural uh, model, we can leverage uh, the runtime verification monitors, okay? And uh, this is very strong because if either the code is wrong or the model is wrong, so there will be an exception uh, that is raised and the test fails. And uh, now I will leave uh, the uh, I will leave the, the the scene to Daniel. So Daniel, please. So hi, this is Daniel. So going in the other other side of the equation here, right? So I just try to turn on my camera. I'm a visual person. This is me. So, runtime verification is a, a lightweight, but uh, yet uh, rigorous form of verification method. And, and it's used in, in, in complement to other methods, right? And uh, RV works by analyzing the trace of a system that is actually running uh, and comparing it to a formal specification of the expected behavior of the system, right? So, <clears throat> trying to, to put 
it in, in, in the Linux context. So in one side, we have the Linux realm, which we see as a set of traces, right? Traces subsystem. In the other side, we have the, the formal realm where we have a, a formal specification of the desired behavior of Linux. And runtime verification stands right in the middle. So in, in one side, it reads the system trace. In the other side, it reads the specification and tries to run the specification with the input from the trace, right? If uh, everything is going doing fine, the system might just run and, and nothing happens. If uh, something not expected in the specification happens, we can take some reactions. For example, we can go to a fail safe mode or we can uh, hit a warning say, okay, this documentation is wrong. So, and, but <clears throat> seeing this technical bit, right? How do we fit it into this more, uh, let's say, uh, political or, or documentary or, or explanation side that is required for for certification authorities, right? It's, it's more the paper side, not in the code side. So the idea that, that uh, Gabriele was explaining now is that we have a, a set of requirements. We will do, uh, we will split it into blocks. We we'll try to do analysis, create documentation and explain uh, how, the, how the system should run, for example, using UML uh, sequence diagrams, right? So the idea here is that with runtime verification, we could theoretically uh, read this input from the diagrams, translate it into code that might run on Linux verifying if uh, the trace is matching with the documentation, right? So it will close the loop between the documentation and, uh, and the documentation and the system, the actual implementation. And it might be useful for, for two things, right? First, to, to improve the documentation, to see if we are covering all the things that we expect, all the, the, the details of the specification in, in the, in, in the, all the details of the kernel in the specification, right? And uh, we do this by showing that, okay, the specification is broken, it's broken, it's broken. If we reach a time in, in, in which the specification might stop being broken, it could stabilize, and then we can start pointing to problems in the kernel. Uh, <clears throat> so the idea, uh, Gabriele came to me and told that, okay, parts of the system that we can describe, there is the runtime part that we use the UML diagram. And uh, you see it's just a sequence of events and, and states, and that can translate straight to a, a formal permit. In, in this example, uh, automata. And those who know me already know where I, I'm going to. So, <clears throat> yes, in last years, people will know because last years I've been trying to use uh, automata to explain the behavior of the kernel, right? And uh, I was able, not using the, this methodology, right, to, for, for trying to explain the properties of the branch RT, uh, I was able to create a, a, a very a considerably large model like with more than 9,000 states and 21,000 transitions using uh, some small specifications. So using it in, in a way that we could understand small specifications and build the big image of the system and, uh, and how to integrate this into, into the practice of a, of a kernel developer, making it code, making it uh, easy to, to run. So, one, before starting, before going to the code side, it's important to recall for, for many people here or to explain to, to the people that was not here uh, one or two years ago, that this, this idea of using automata to verify the runtime behavior of Linux is efficient. Uh, one of the questions that is often raised if, uh, for, for the application of um, formal methods is, how much time does it take to verify a property or to, ver to verify the system? And uh, here, <clears throat> there's a paper. I, I will post a link to this paper where I show that running an automata inside of the kernel as code, C code, uh, uh, synchronously to the system, it is faster actually than tracing the same event to the trace buffer for the later analysis. We have all the details on the paper and I will put the link uh, later. So that, that, that was more the research side. 
And the good thing is that this is getting practical. Uh, earlier this year, I submitted uh, the first version of what could be the runtime verification interface for the kernel. You have the link here. <clears throat> and, uh, and it was welcome, welcome by, by, the, by some key people. Steven, I, I'm targeting this as a complement, a complement of the trace interface inside the kernel. So thanks and to Steven, Steven like it. I had some good feedback from people like Peter, Azistra. <clears throat> so things, things seems to be feasible, right? And it's mostly the, the this interface is, is built upon two pieces of software. And uh, the first piece is the .2K, which is a tool that can translate these automata format in the GraphViz format. An automata using the GraphViz format, we can translate it into code, a C code that represents the same automata. And I also added it, uh, some uh, macro functions that can read that model code and uh, enable it to run inside of the kernel as native C code. And the only thing that is left for a developer is to connect one automata event or one UML diagram event to the kernel event that represents it. So it's just the instrumentation part. The, the patch set includes the documentation that explain all these steps and in, at a good level. And so, and um, once you have uh, your model compiled and loaded into the system, you can load models on, on demand. Uh, you just go to the trace interface, <clears throat> like here, for example, syskernel tracing. Uh, I created an, an RV director there. And I can say things like, for example, in the second line here, I can say that I want to activate a reaction when something bad happens for this WIP monitor. I say, okay, please panic the system if, if an unexpected event happens on this, uh, this uh, WIP um, uh, model, right? And to enable the monitoring of this model that would be hooked to the events and starts to run in the automata, you just uh, enable echo WP enable monitor. So uh, a very common uh, way to do things in the tracing, tracing subsystem. And um, one, one thing that I also added is that the developer can watch the monitor uh, running by, for example, enabling these trace points and reading them via ftrace or via ebpf or via perf or anything you can hook to, to events. And uh, yeah, uh, that, that's the idea, to use monitors to transform documentation into C code and they use it to verify if the documentation is correct and if the, the kernel is correct. Uh, there is a lot of information about it around. I have published some uh, more, uh, a summary of this research on Red Hat Research Quarterly magazine. It's, it points to all the, the, the points that you, you might be interested to, to understand. A more heavy documentation, you see there are two academic papers here, one journal and a conference, and they have all the details of the implementation in the, in the more, let's say, formal side. And finally, there's a link for the for a presentation I gave at the LC 2019. I think it was the last event I went in person. And uh, it explains all the details of the formal presentation we did. And yeah, and it's, it's back to Gabriela. Okay, so thank you, Daniel. Um, so having uh, talked about the um, real-time verification monitor, um, we can now go you know, to the last slide about the pain points and the next steps. <clears throat> um, okay, so uh, communication diagrams, uh, so the, between subsystem uh, and drivers, so this can be supported by static analysis tool of the code. And uh, we have developed, uh, uh, we, I mean, Mobileye uh, has developed uh, a call tree tool in the context uh, of ELISA, and uh, this is public and uh, um, I can provide the, uh, the reference uh, to it. So this tool is able to support the, the generation of these um, static uh, communication diagrams okay and uh, the dynamic diagrams so the the baseline for them the only the baseline that could be 
automatically generated by tracing uh, the interfaces between subsystem uh, once we have the communication diagrams. So basically what we do, we stick traces uh, to, to the interfaces between the subsystems and then the, the dynamic uh, uh, trace log would be a sort of baseline of flow diagram. The, this is indeed, you know, only a baseline, okay? So that cannot be our flow diagram because otherwise, um, you know, if there are bugs in the code, we will never be able to spot them because it will be an architecture automatically, you know, generated um, based on the code. And this is wrong, okay? So um, the idea is that, so we can have tool to generate baselines. However, it is absolutely mandatory to have a human review of the code and uh, and of the uh, generated uh, baseline so that the, the model is, uh, uh, the, the real architecture model is, is created by, by human, okay? And, uh, and another pain point is indeed kernel doc headers because if we say that the top level specification of drivers and subsystems and anyway, whatever is a unit, is written following the kernel doc headers. It, it is, uh, you know, mandatory to 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 you know to expand these uh, kernel doc headers uh, so that um, the, the the missing uh, behavior is also uh, reported uh, in the headers itself. Right. Um, so it is a significant amount of work, really. Um, uh, however. Uh, you know, uh, so this is the, the idea, you know, behind uh, this model. Uh, next step, so the first one is indeed to develop and refine the tools that would augment and support the generation of the software architecture models. Uh, continue the development of the runtime verification interface. And, uh, and then finally would be, you know, to go high scale, trying to push the tools and engage with the, with maintainers to you know to also to to push uh, uh, the the models and the, the architectural description. Okay, so indeed, this is uh, this can be done gradually, right? Starting from the subsystems that are more critical, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, this would be the, the idea. And now I think we have uh, it's uh, questions and answers time. So 